um, and we are recording. So welcome everyone. Uh, people are gonna start to trickle in here. All right, so I think I'm gonna go ahead and get started and we'll wait for uh, some more attendees to, to come in while I'm introducing you all. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Jasper Bors and I'm the Speakers Director of the Buckley Program. I'm thrilled to welcome you to the first panel of our 2020 annual conference. This is the 10th annual conference the Buckley Program has held since 2010. Today's panel entitled The Great Society and American Economic Stagnation from the 60s to today um, will focus on America's industrial slowdown, limited state capacity, and rise in inequality. These trends have had a long history in the United States, and this, and this discussion will address those themes and more to provide some insight into the current economic malaise and what kinds of pro policies needed, are needed to address it. Before I introduce our guest this afternoon, I want to say a few words about the Buckley Program. The William F. Buckley Jr. Program is an organization dedicated to promoting intellectual diversity and open political discussion at Yale. We host lectures, dinner seminars, fire and line debates, and an annual conference every year since 2010. Our over 300 Buckley Fellows have a wide range of political beliefs, but they all stand united against the formation of a liberal only echo chamber on campus. By providing Yale students with a forum to engage meaningfully with serious conservative thought, the Buckley program has become an institution on Yale's campus and a symbol for a more open and more representative political atmosphere. Especially at a university where the mission is the cultivation and creation of new knowledge, Buckley Fellows believe that all perspectives must be heard and examined in good faith. You can learn more about the program and how to become a fellow on our website, buckleyprogram.com. Now on to our guest today. Julius Krein is the editor of American Affairs, a quarterly journal of policy and political thought. Prior to founding American Affairs, he was an investment analyst at various private equity and hedge funds. His writing has appeared in the New York Times, the Washington Post, Times Literary Supplement, the American Conservative, and other publications. Michael R. Strain is the Director of Economic Policy Studies and the Arthur F. Burns Scholar in Political Economy at the American Enterprise Institute. He is the author of the recently published book, The American Dream is Not Dead, But Populism Could Kill It, which examines longer term economic outcomes for workers and households. An economist, his research has been published in peer reviewed academic journals and, policy, and in policy journals, and he's edited two books on economics and public policy. Dr. Strain also writes frequently for popular audiences, and his essays and op-eds have been published by the Wall Street Journal, the New York Times, and the Washington Post, among others. He is a columnist for Bloomberg Opinion, and he is frequently interviewed by major media outlets, speaks often to a variety of audiences, and has testified before Congress. Before, before joining AEI, he worked at the U.S. Census Bureau and the Federal Reserve Bank of New York. He holds a PhD from Cornell. Amity Chalaise chairs the board of the Calvin Coolidge Presidential Foundation, a foundation which is based at the birthplace of the 30th president in Plymouth Notch, Vermont, with an office in the Georgetown area of Washington, DC. The Coolidge Foundation is the sponsor of the popular Coolidge Scholarship, a full college scholarship for academic merit and the Coolidge Senators Program, which exposes gifted students to the, va to the values of President Coolidge. Her, new her newest book is The Great Society, A New History, which is gonna going to be coming out in a few months, I'm told, um, I I or a few weeks, uh, and there's, 35,000 copies I've heard, so pick that up while you can. Um, Michelle is the author of five previous books, four of which are New York Times bestsellers, Germany, The Empire Within, The Greedy Hand, Why Taxes Drive Americans Crazy, The Forgotten Man, Man A New History of the Great Depression, and Coolidge, and The Forgotten Man uh, slash graphic. She was a syndicated columnist for 10 years, first at the Financial Times, then Bloomberg. Before that, she served as an editorial board member at the Wall Street Journal, and over the decades, she has published in periodicals, including The New Republic, The New Yorker, The Spectator of London, The New York Times, The Washington Post, and The National Review. For the past five years, she's chaired the jury of the Hayek Prize, the Manhattan Institute's Book Prize. She also serves as a presidential scholar at the King's College in New York. Additionally, I'd like to recognize our co-sponsor for this panel, the American Enterprise Institute. AEI's Executive Council at Yale brings scholars from one of Washington's premier think tanks to campus for wide ranging conversations on domestic and foreign policy. We're thrilled to host Dr. Strain as part of this program, and I would encourage all undergrads watching this to apply for AEI's Summer Honors Program, and specifically Dr. Strain's Summer Honors class. Please reach out to me with any questions. We'll begin by having each guest give a brief opening statement, followed by questions from myself, and finally questions from the audience, which you can submit through um, throughout the event via Zoom's Q&A feature. 
And on a final note, please join us for our second panel in the conference tomorrow um, at uh, 4 30 p.m. on Woodstock, the Sexual Revolution, and the Decay of American Social Order. The panel will feature Christopher Caldwell, Mary Eberstadt, Helen Andrews, and Christine Rosen. So with that, please join me in warmly welcoming Julius Krein, Amity Schlaes, and Michael Strain virtually to Yale and the Buckley program. Uh, Mr. Krein, we're going to give you the first opening statement, and then we'll move to Ms. Schlaes and finally Dr. Strain. Okay, well, uh, thank you very much for um, inviting me today. Uh, I have to admit I've been puzzling a bit for the last few days why, um, why I was invited for this. Uh, I've been called many things on, on the internet over the last few years, but a historian of the Great Society or the Johnson administration has never been one of them. Um, so I hope nobody got the wrong impression. But uh, nevertheless, what I think is probably most interesting about this topic is that while there's probably not a lot that um, myself and the other panelists agree on. Uh, I don't wanna sound presumptuous, but I'm going to guess that the others are not going to offer a, an unqualified endorsement of the Great Society. Um, and I, I would count myself as fairly critical of it as well. Though I suspect that the reasons for my criticism may be a bit different. Um, so for the sake of conversation, at least, uh, I'll try to emphasize those. Um, to me, the real failing of the Great Society uh, is that it's the first of the, the sort of big American uh, economic programs um, that really uh, ignores what I would call the production side uh, of the economy, largely ignores it um, compared to the New Deal and particularly the war effort compared to, say, Eisenhower's infrastructure spending in the 50s. Um, compared to older programs around um, frontier infrastructure and settlement and all that, uh, the Great Society strikes me as much more welfareist, much more redistribution focused, um, and spends and, and really uh, very, very, very little, very few parts of it are focused on building, uh, strengthening American industry, improving U.S. technological position, so on and so forth. Um, and that really couldn't have come at a worse time uh, in some respects because uh, late 60s, uh, the rest of the world is really starting to recover um, from the wreckage of World War II uh, and their economies are really picking up. Uh, a number of them have begun experimenting with and impl implementing very sophisticated industrial policies uh, that will really bear fruit in the coming years. Uh, Leading as a you know one factor leading to um, the breakup of Bretton Woods among other things, uh, and the Great Society um, and ramping up government spending uh, on a lot of welfare programs without really building up uh, U.S. economic strength, I think contributes to a lot of these issues. Leading as everybody I'm sure knows are contributing to uh, the stagflation and so on of the 70s. Um, Unfortunately, I think the, uh, and I actually, before I go into the conservative critique, I mean, I think a few other parts of it are worth mentioning. It's kind of interesting how some of these, some of these things are still with us. Um, for instance, you know, uh, the, the Medicare side of it, uh, the healthcare side of it, um, you know, it was a huge mistake, I think, to do this purely for, for the elderly in certain parts of the population without actually just trying to design a sensible state-run healthcare system. Um, it has made it uh, incredibly difficult to reform the rest of the healthcare system and created a constituency very much opposed to reform while making it nearly impossible to control costs with uh, public programs and at the same time undermining any potential case for uh, a true free market system, which, which you know, I don't think is really a serious possibility anyway. Um, other weird aspects of it, you know, uh, the Johnson administration privatizes things like Fannie Mae out of this, out of a kind of uh, cosmetic attempt to control the budget deficit or what, what you know federal budget looks like and things like that. Obviously, those sort of artificial privatizations um, or the you know privatizations of one side of it while leaving in place government guarantees end up having major impact later. Um, but to get in a little bit to the what I think the conservative critique of it misses. Uh, I think you know once 
once this uh, this formation, or that once this once this policy was opened up, where the only issue was really about consumption and a question over how much welfare, how much government spending, um, production fell away from the thought of the conservative side too. And the rise of marginalist economics, which largely excludes these issues, treats them as exogenous, um, perhaps also contributes to this. Uh, but the conservative critique and the conservative reforms in the 80s, um, you know, really don't attempt to address the issues of uh, the, comp the competitiveness, competitiveness of US firms facing uh, foreign competitors uh, in a very different environment with foreign subsidies. Um, it doesn't really address how new technologies are created. And immediately that's less of a problem because the Reagan administration is still fighting the Cold War and is investing very heavily public funds into the research and development of new technologies through the Defense Department. Um, but all that goes away after the Cold War. And also uh, the Reagan administration was fairly protectionist on trade. And once the Iron Curtain comes down and China and so on are incorporated into uh, trade agreements uh, where you have a lot of potential, a lot more potential for labor regulatory, other forms of arbitrage. Um, the lack of focus on this really exposes US industry um, to all the disadvantages of facing uh, places like China and all of that. And I think I won't dwell too much on that story. I think that's, you know, Pretty out there, um, but it creates a significant problem when you begin losing um, so many industries from, you know, machine tools to semiconductors to LCD screens, uh, offshoring core elements of aircraft design and manufacture, and on and on and on. Um, you not only have issues from a national security perspective or whatever, but increasing problems in uh, the innovation side of the economy, producing uh, greater growth and commercializing that growth domestically uh, to create uh, the sort of so-called good jobs that everybody wants. Um, the other part of the conservative critique that misses the mark, I would say is, was the social conservative critique, which basically blames the welfare state for the breakup of families and so on. And while I would not necessarily uncritically endorse all of the Great Society welfare programs. I think it's clear at this point that pairing them back and reforming them in the 90s didn't actually do too much to improve family formation or uh, out of wedlock births uh, and all of that. So I think at this point, uh, the social conservative critiques, um, people are in the process of rethinking those. I'm not sure that those have played out. So I think I've used up all of my time. Uh, we can obviously get into any of these issues and. Happy to do that in the Q and A, uh, but I'll stop there. Great, thanks, uh, Ms. Schleis. Well, thank you. I'm glad to be here. It's a great day to be here. I think uh, all three of us agree on more points uh, than uh, we might acknowledge. One reason uh, today is a great day is because of the news of the effectiveness of the COVID vaccine Pfizer is developing. Apparently, it's a very effective vaccine. And uh, you can see that the stock market went up after a year of federal, state, local effort to take America out of a mood of pandemic panic to rescue, to save lives. Um, a force has emerged that probably will be doing so, this vaccine. And that force, you'll notice, is not the National Institutes of Health. It is not the Biden administration. It is not the Trump administration. It is not. WHO and it is not a bipartisan COVID commission. The force is actually a private company, Pfizer, um, that may have come up with a solution to this particular problem. I think the COVID year, these are, um, you know, my book, uh, The Great Society, uh, suggests the Great Society was not always great. Um, and the emphasis is the folly of well meaning people. Um, the COVID year also reminds us a little bit about the way our society solves problems. We look to the federal government for help, at least a show of help. We get a number of experts, serious experts, taking strong positions. Yes, ventilator, no mask. And then the same experts reverse themselves, looking silly or at worst tragic. 
um, the COVID year was a year, is a year that demonstrates the folly of public knowledge and the public expert. Some of you will think of Hayek, that is also of whom I am thinking. Um, we do all, always count on the individual and the private sector to be the rescuer. Um, one of the remarkable things is here um, in terms of individuals is the restraint of individuals and families, uh, the willingness to engage in a siege of a quarantine, not a week, not a month. If you'd interviewed people and said, will families stay home for a year um, to protect old people, which is really what this was, um, we might have said doubtful. Well, they did. And that shows America's goodwill. I want to mention that because usually this whole story is told kind of uh, sardonically and ironically and as a disappointment of cynicism. It hasn't been. Americans were and have been vis-a-vis -vis COVID more or less good neighbors. Um, the private sector does, as I mentioned, look, uh, emerge as a better servant. Um, and there's a general sense, whether you're a Marxist or a free marketeer, that the private sector is going to help in future. It bumps up on a vaccine as today, the Dow went up today. And everyone, all of us assume that the market will go up some more. If the Dow is 28,000 or maybe hopefully 30,000 now, it will get to 40,000 and more vaccines will come and so on. That our phones and the private sector will deliver like that. Point, stop, but only when we allow it to. And now I'll speak a little bit about what happened in the great society period vis-a-vis um, -vis these, these sectors, public and private. Um, the idealism of the 60s matched that of today. You have a period when everyone thought they were doing all right. It, we didn't call what we saw a good society. That was too tame. We called it a great society. And much of the discussion in those days was about the public sector as vehicle to the great society. Um, President Johnson committed not just to alleviating property, poverty, but he, he spoke of curing it. He used that term C-U-R-E, cure. His vehicle were a, a bunch of federal programs that sound a lot like ones we're talking about today, programs that fostered opportunity, maybe had to raise some taxes for that, increasing education in cities and schools, invigorating communities, disenfranchised where there were riots through federally supported action, helping African Americans and Native Americans through federal endeavor other vehicles, and I hope we can discuss this because I learned a lot researching this book, uh, more strong union law. Um, the idea was that the unions would take the lead in showing, taking us to a great society through the development, um, through piloting social democracy. There would be more jobs fostered by government union law, essentially. Well, what would the private sector do? It would fund the public sector. That was the idea. Um, you can see uh, Daniel Patrick Moynihan over my shoulder. Uh, Moynihan kind of uh, was a wonderful senator and thinker. He's been compared to Edmund Burke lately, but he was also a master tweaker. You send the money and I will tweak until I find the optimal government program. This is his guaranteed income book. Nothing is new. It is just forgotten. Um, it was said generally at the period that in the period that America could afford anything. Um, there was a joke um, supposedly of Lenin's that was that was repeated here. Um, socialism is a good goal and America is the only country that can afford it. Um, but I, when I looked at the period, I saw the private sector thought of itself as more than milk cow or public private partner. It thought it could take us to great all by itself, self through endeavor. So in my history of the Great Society, which sounds like a government book, I do trace the optimism, idealism, and action of several private companies. I'll just mention one, because I don't want to take too much time. That was Fairchild. Um, Fairchild, uh, as many of you know, later became Intel. It was just a bunch of smart, obnoxious guys. They were called the Traitorous Eight because they had a habit of quitting companies that didn't give them a long enough leash, and they wanted equity um, when they developed their ideas. They had an idea, this smaller chip. Uh, the chip mattered not only to serve um, the great engines of Boeing or, um, the, uh, sorry about that, the engines in, um, in the Vietnam War. Excuse me, guys. Um, this is very embarrassing. <laughs> 
going to work. Okay. But also because small chips made electronic appliances, even tiny appliances possible. Gordon Moore and Robert Noyce, the founders, they believe they could make products that would make American life great, such as desktop computers, smartphones, or smarter or smarter cars. There's something slightly crass. I went to Yale. There's something slightly crass or perceived as crass in praising the private sector in this way. But, um, but I don't think it's crass when you look at the evidence. Um, the chip idea was a great one. Um, you, the result was very social because Fairchild and then Intel, of course, hired up and trained many, many Americans. Um, private efforts, private company efforts are often laughed at. What can slick people working in the future Silicon Valley, Stanford type people, engineering type people understand of the poverty the work of the Great Society, the poverty of Native, Native Americans in New Mexico. As it turned out a lot, Fairchild needed entry level workers to train up to work on their tiny chips. The needlework of the Native Americans in Shiprock, New Mexico prepared them for fine work under a magnifying glass. Fairchild, these future Intel people opened a factory on the reservation in Shiprock, New Mexico, and very shortly gave the Native Americans what the government wasn't giving them, serious jobs. Fairchild, through this work in New Mexico with Native Americans, became the greatest single private sector employer of Native Americans in the United States. In that way, they gave a model for what would be a great society for many Native Americans. We're going to talk about the public sector in a bit. The results were more than mixed. I do want to talk about union law. In my book, I make the point that training Americans to entitlements and the Supreme Court cementing that by treating entitlements as a kind of property has had long lasting effects whose consequences we live with. But the main point of the book, and I'll stop right here, um, what I discovered in researching uh, my history of the Great Society um, is that the public sector hurt the private sector. It, we couldn't count on it. By 71, we were spending more in domestic programs than in Vietnam with the war still very seriously on. The public sector crowded out the private sector. The private sector was, um, the spending by the government was too much for the private sector. It couldn't carry the whole load. The result was our economic purgatory, um, a period when New York felt um, the way it did this summer, which is to say kind of sad, uh, kind of like a balloon losing air. Um, I mentioned the Dow earlier, just to close that loop. I think it's important for all of us to remember um, that uh, when the Great Society launched, the Dow was pretty confident that it would get past their um, landmark, which was a thousand. Um, we did not cross that landmark in the 70s. We had a spongy, sorrowful economy without investment, investment where a lot of the ideas developed by, um, by people um, such as the people at Intel stayed on the shelf because of counterproductive policy. Um, we can talk about a lot of other points today. Um, my point is just Take the great the private sector seriously. Um, be skeptical of public private partnership. I'm talking about public v private, not public and private. Private does better when it's competing. It's a competitive animal. Um, and uh, I was just very shocked in reviewing the period to write this book. How much the private sector contributed and um, the extent tragic extent of the consequences of its abuse. Wonderful, thank you. Dr. Strain. Oh, sorry. Hello. Um, you would think I would know how to use this technology by now. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. It's a pleasure to be with, uh, uh, with Amity and, 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 and Julius. Um, thanks to everybody for tuning in. Thanks for your kind words about uh, AEI's campus programs and our program at Yale. It's something that we take very seriously and, and uh, I'm uh, very happy to, to be participating. Um, you know, I'll, uh, I'll address the, um, the, the, the topic, you know, which is economic stagnation uh from the uh from the 60s to the present i think is the title um 
the great society and American stagnation from the 60s to today. And I'll argue that this, uh, uh, this notion that America has been economically stagnant for decades is really misplaced. Um, this is a common notion. Uh, it is a notion that uh, you hear from the political left and the political right. It's a notion that you hear from populists on the political left and the political right. Uh, President Trump, when he took office um, four years ago, uh, bemoaned American carnage, spoke of uh, rusted out factories dotting the landscape like tombstones. Uh, Senator Bernie Sanders, the populist progressive argues that the American dream has become an American nightmare, that workers have seen their hours of work go up and up and up and their pay go down and down. Senator Josh Hawley, the conservative populist, who is uh, going to attempt to um, kind of pick up the Trumpian mantle and carry it forward, argues that 70% of workers haven't seen a wage increase in 30 years. Uh, this, is, this is a argument you hear from economists. It's an argument you hear from public intellectuals. It's an argument you hear from business leaders. And it's an argument that I think is just not right. Uh, if you look at the wages of typical workers, workers who uh, in the service sector are not managers, workers who in the manufacturing sector are uh, not supervisors uh, who are production workers, uh, workers in the construction sector who are construction workers. This is about 80% of all workers and you look at their average wage over the past 30 years, what you see is that it's gone up by about one third. Um, that's a significant increase in purchasing power. If you look at income, uh, which includes wages, but also includes uh, government transfer payments, you see that incomes at the bottom have gone up by two thirds over that time period. Now, this is a smaller rate of increase than uh, the increase enjoyed by the top 1%. Um, but it is a considerable increase in purchasing power. Uh, and it's an increase in purchasing power that has accrued to the betterment of workers um, uh, all throughout the income distribution, uh, not just workers at the top. Um, if you look at the issue of uh, dynamism, which many say has removed opportunities, but not created them uh, for the middle class and led to middle class stagnation. What in fact you see is that, um, is that dynamism has created many opportunities and that while it's true that the kind of traditional middle of the labor market in manufacturing and construction uh, has hollowed out, a new middle is forming right alongside of it that emphasizes different skills, it, 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 it requires different things, um, but uh, uh, there it is and it offers middle-class wages and, and, and a middle-class life. If you look at economic mobility, you were kind enough to mention my new book. I have a copy of it here. Everybody should, everybody should go buy it. The American dream is not dead, but populism can kill it. Um, I present some calculations in my new book where I where I uh, uh, find that over 80% of people today, of adults today who are in their 40s, have a higher household income than their parents had when their parents were in their 40s. Um, uh, this is not stagnation. It is not uh, a lack of economic mobility. In fact, it's considerable upward economic mobility, um, especially from the bottom. Uh, and so I think when 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 people actually review the record, which is what I try to do in my in my book, the 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 argument that that America has experienced stagnation, that typical workers haven't had uh, uh, any increase in their in their in their uh, wages and incomes, that America is no longer an upwardly mobile society. I think all of these assertions are just are just false. Um, and I think this matters. It matters particularly for young people, I think, though not exclusively for young people. You know, the evidence suggests that hard work pays off. The evidence suggests that uh, people 
can better their circumstances. The evidence suggests that America is still an upwardly mobile society. But if you believe that those things aren't true, and if you believe that they aren't true because that's all you hear, um, then you may not work hard. You may not aspire as, as much as you otherwise would have. And you can end up uh, not doing as well because of this message that you are hearing. Um, and so in a way, this message of pessimism and this message of stagnation uh, uh, creates a self-reinforcing uh, mechanism that it, that it can actually lead to uh, or help to create the very problems that it incorrectly argues exist. So that's why it's important for, for students and for young people to, to get the facts about these things um and, and and to know what's going on uh you know the on the topic of the great society um i think it's important not to conclude from my conclusion that america is not a stagnant immobile ossified society that therefore President Johnson was wrong to attempt to fight poverty, that therefore we don't need uh, anti-poverty efforts. We do. Um, we need those efforts to help people to achieve economic self-sufficiency. We need those efforts to help people who are displaced by economic dynamism and economic change. Uh, and we need those programs to help advance an understanding of employment uh, as uh, a dignified undertaking. Um, and thought of in that way, a safety net that doesn't give handouts, that doesn't give a cold shoulder, uh, but that instead gives a hand up uh, is I think uh, the right framework for thinking about which anti-poverty programs are good and which need improvement it's the right framework for thinking about how anti-poverty programs should be advanced, both in light of the pandemic, but also in light of the uh, the, the changing economy that we are always in. Um, and so I will stop there and thank you. Great, okay. Um, so I'm gonna ask the first question and then we'll see kind of where we are in terms of time and then might ask a few audience questions, but I'll try to tie together a few of the threads which you all have pulled on um, and so I wanted to ask, scholars since the 70s have kind of come to recognize in the social sciences, at least the managerial class as an obstacle. Well, it's debated to what extent it's an obstacle to productivity and economic growth. Um, and this class has undoubtedly expanded since the 1960s. And some have argued that its expansion has been the cause of, of populist sentiment in the United States. So how closely do you, do you think the ascent of this class kind of maps on to uh, relative American economic weakness? And is there sort of a reason to be optimistic about the labor market returning to a more productive paradigm um, now that COVID has kind of dramatically shifted the meaning of work? And I mean, I, I think it would be great to also kind of hit on this issue of unions, which some of you have brought up um, in your answers. So we'll, we can go kind of down the ballot again, starting with, uh, with Julius. Well, um... I mean, I think that the managerial class is, it hasn't really been ascendant, I think, for a long time um, economically. Uh, it was back in the 80s when Barbara Ehrenreich wrote Fear of Falling. Um, and I wrote a piece a couple of years ago that uh, discusses it called The Real Class War, if you want to check it out. But actually, a lot of the opportunities for um, mid-level, whatever, uh, professionals in finance for um, lawyers, uh, et cetera, even most of the STEM economy are not actually that great. Um, it's a fairly small part of a small number of STEM graduates that are working in their fields. Um, you know, given the amount of grad school and student loan debt, uh, the incomes are not that high. Given the high real estate costs in the places where most of these jobs are, um, the incomes are not that great. And that may be one reason why, despite some of the statistics on relatively better income, you still see a lot of widespread um, discontent, uh, perhaps especially among this class, and why you have a sort of revived 
socialist movement in America and people uh, feeling so unhappy about their economic prospects. Um, I think what is actually the most significant part of this is, you know, in contrast to the 60s, when you, you had, you know, your high tech part of your economy at the time, your IBMs, your GEs, whatever, um, you had much tighter vertical or much uh, a more expansive vertical integration. So you had your IP producing parts of the economy along with, uh, you know, and the same company would employ uh, huge numbers of workers, um, take GM, whatever. Uh, today you have actually through uh, a lot of the financial engineering that began in the 80s and so on, you sort of hived off a lot of the high margin capital light IP parts of the economy from uh, the rest of the, the, uh, the companies that actually employ a lot of workers. Um, you see that in finance, you see that in tech, you see it even in very low tech, in traditionally low tech industries like hotels. So for example, Hilton, Hilton is basically an entity that holds a lot of IP related to the Hilton brand uh, and has a few employees that manage, you know, its franchises. The hotels are owned by, you know, private equity firms. The individual hotel management is contracted out to one company. The maids are contracted out to another company. And so you have a lot of low margin businesses with a lot of employees that actually are very, very, with very compressed margins uh, without a lot of money to raise wages, that sort of thing. And then you have at the top of the economy, a lot of entities holding a lot of intellectual property that are raking in all the profits um, and often very easy to uh, take advantage of tax havens and so on. Um, even in like the tech sector, you have Facebook, Google, all of that at the pinnacle of the profit making of the industry. Whereas the companies that are doing all the investment, the Comcast, the AT&Ts, uh, whatever, um, yeah, they're, they're okay, they're profitable, they're heavily indebted and so on. They have much less money to, to make uh, capital investment. Um, but I think that uh, is a more significant function. So you end up with um, you know, uh, a very narrow stratum of the managerial class uh, making a lot of money. Uh, and and greater and greater parts of the economy feeling increasingly uh, proletarianized. Thank you, uh, Amity. I think you're muted. That's a good question about the managers. I would put the managers together with the unions. I don't know if any of you have seen the movie Ford v Ferrari, um, but it's sort of about a bumbling giant um, uh, the Ford, uh, you know, the Ford heir, the Ford who led Ford them was a goofy guy versus an entrepreneurial underdog um, and, a, and a, um, you know, a, a spunky competitor that would have been Ferrari. Um, so uh, managers colluded with unions to render companies uneconomic. Where do we see that most? I mean, we, we've all seen the Michael Moore videos and, and documentaries, managers together with unions, the UAW in specific, killed Detroit and Flint more than anything else. They did by rendering in a kind of little social democratic dream of what we could afford, rendering these businesses, that is the big three, uncompetitive when suddenly our competition arose. And Toyota is in my book quite a bit as, um, as the competitor who emerges from nowhere while the union is preoccupied with politics and, and, and again, a sort of social democratic dream. Um, William F. Buckley always referred to forced unionism by which he meant the kind of law the United States had before the Taft-Hartley Act, which was passed after World War II. That is every state basically had something closer to a closed shop. You had to join the union to work at the company. And that changed with Taft Hartley. Some states could opt out. This is sometimes called right to work. And um, Johnson, um, as now, um, was thinking, well, maybe we should close that loophole and have forced unionism, as Buckley would call it, or unionism, as Johnson would call it, in all 50 states again repeal that component of Taft-Hartley. He was very um, eager to do that. And union leaders like George Meany were eager to do so too. Johnson just never got to it because of the Vietnam 
war and the social democracy, social agenda he was pursuing. So the accident was, was that right to work loophole continued to exist and we were the beneficiaries of a large national natural experiment whereby we saw that states that have lighter union laws tend to grow faster. That was very useful for us. And you've seen the decline of heavy unionism just in the numbers in, in the private sector. Um, so my point here would be uh, managers uh, uh, of the um, technocrat type and unions tend to hurt our competitiveness. Um, and we should be very wary of strengthening our law to go back to the old way that, that favors them. I was astonished to see what damage the unions did. Uh, I'm from Illinois, where every night on the television, the name of the union leader, Walter Ruther, was spoken with reverence. He was a lovable guy. He hurt his own workers and their children by making employment too expensive. Uh, Ford colluded with him out of idiocy and Toyota took it all away. So, so we don't wanna repeat that error or assume that unions are benign when they're aggressive in demanding higher wages. We are no longer in the 1950s when we had no competition. We have plenty of competition no matter what kind of tariffs the president puts on. And we have to be aware of making what we call costing pricing what we make attractively. Um, there was also, by the way, a cost in innovation. Toyota wasn't just cheaper, its products were better. Uh, and that's another discussion. But anyway, I, I, I think um, the foolishness of managers it needs to be underscored. Thank you, Dr. Strain. You know, I think the the issue of unions is a is a is a good issue to think about because it it illustrates uh, trade offs and public policy. Um, and you know, a lot of the a lot of the policy debate, uh, you know, argues that there are a lot of free lunches out there. Um, you can raise the minimum wage to fifteen dollars an hour, and everybody will get a raise, and nobody will lose their job. You hear that one on the left a lot. Um, on the political right, over the past few years, you've heard the same thing with tariffs. You know, we can we can levy tariffs against our trading partners. China will pay them. No one in the United States will be negatively affected. Everybody will be helped. Um, and this type of free lunch thinking is, 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 is pernicious and dangerous, I think. Uh, you know, unions um, do some good things. Unions increase the wages of union members. And if you, you know, support people having higher wages, then that's a reason to support unions. Um, there is bargaining that takes place between unions and between, I'm sorry, between workers and managers. And unions help to give voice to workers and can kind of tip the balance of power a little bit in the favor of workers. At the same time, unions reduce employment and, uh, and reduce the number of employment and opportunities that are available, particularly to vulnerable workers and to uh, workers with relatively fewer skills and, and to workers with relatively less experience. And so the question is, is that trade-off worth it? You know, I think that, that the first uh, priority, particularly at a time with high unemployment and a weak economy and a weak labor market like we have now, but even when the economy is considerably stronger than it currently is, is to uh, err on the side of advancing opportunity, uh, particularly to workers with fewer skills, particularly to workers with less experience. Um, and so I uh, support efforts to, to weaken the, the strength of labor unions. Um, that's how I view the trade-off. Uh, but starting to think about policies in terms of trade-offs is, uh, you know, if, if we did that more often, we'd be in a better place. All right. Um, I actually jump in there on the union question because yeah, of course. Uh, things moved a bit. I, I would just very quickly add, um, make the point though that Toyota, when it outcompeted the US companies was heavily unionized. Um, the German car companies are heavily unionized. Uh, there is the one difference I think, you know, the American 
unions were always uh, is a very confrontational um, strategy and very you know, always independent kind of from the state. Uh, unions uh, in the rest of the world, it's you know a more corporatist model, a more tripartite model. Um, in Germany and Japan, where you have uh, management or capital, the unions and the state, with the state kind of mediating and managing some of this. Um, and that seems to have been a better model, uh, allowing for maybe a little better bargaining concessions around competitiveness, uh, while also maintaining some worker power to extract um, wage benefits and so on, without having to force this kind of either or, either or choice that uh, I think American firms actually did face after the 70s of either crushing the unions um, or, or facing uh, continued decline versus competitors. Um, I would just quick one point counter that Toyota's we, uh, union in the period it began to be a threat to the United States or a beauty in the United States, depending on your interpretation, their unions were rather weak. They existed, they, but they were weak. They were not like co-determination in Germany. And only later did they change. When you were, even in those days, we're talking now about the 60s, if you were a worker on the Toyota floor and you saw something wrong on the assembly line, you had the authority to stop the assembly line and, and speak up um, and give your advice on how to fix the problem. In the 1960s, if there was a problem on the assembly line and it needed halting, we waited two hours for someone to go get someone from the electricians union because only the electricians union was allowed to mess with electrics, right, electronics. And the assembly line waited, the, word, the worker was through American unionism infantilized and compensated with good benefits. The Japanese worker, contrary to stereotype, had more say in what was going on. It was a more democratic structure. I refer you to the work of Michael Cusimano on that. And um, secondly, I just wanna say um, about unions, I, I think I would rephrase, um, if you support higher wages, wages, you have to support unions. I would uh, offer another um, version of that. If you support higher wages, you have to foster higher productivity. Uh, unions are or are not part of it. They can be, but the real issue is the productivity for the long-term um, stability of the job and the prospects of the job. And when the unions, uh, and I'm, I'm surprised to be talking so much about unions, but I think it's warranted given the current interest in unions. When the unions get in the way of productivity, which is most of the time um, as lovable as they are, then we have to acknowledge that. Great. Um, so I think probably I would like to get to maybe one audience question to ask of all of you. Um, so this audience member asks, do you think that there are any, any drastic changes, sort of exogenous changes in the 1960s that uh, more directly undermined our economic health in the long term? So uh, he gives examples, things like the rise of the drug use, um, the decline of kind of an idea of the work ethic and decline of respect for the rule of law in the 1960s. Any of you are welcome to, to step up to take that. Well, one of the things about the 60s was the decline in academic standards um, that, that commenced then. Um, and uh, we began to say some people can't score well, let's change the system. That was the beginning of uh, the beginning of that. After the sort of high score push of the, uh, of the you know, October sky of the rocket scare Sputnik race, um, there was a shift. And I think that was, um, we still have, we still have so much trouble from that today because most Americans actually can do trigonometry, but they have to be encouraged to do so. And they're not being currently by our schools, um, particularly, unfortunately, not many public schools. Uh, so they're being let down by that. Um, and that, that commenced in the 60s. Yeah, uh, Dr. Strain or um, Julius, you're welcome to uh, answer as well. Otherwise, you can move on to another question. I like Anthony's answer. Okay. Um, so, another audience question, Mr. Krein, you have argued that in order for the GOP to have a future in America, it must be working class. Many working class whites abandoned the Democratic Party in 1968, in some part due to the party's focus on racial issues rather than economic growth, and voted for Richard Nixon. What are the similarities between this period and today? Um, 
Unfortunately, probably not too many. Uh, I think, I mean, what I say, what I discuss that the, the GOP will have to be able to um, attract working class voters. I mean, I think for the last several years, the GOP has basically been carrying water um, for financial and other elite sectors uh, out of ideological inertia, basically. And um, at this point, those sectors uh, give far more to Democratic opponents. Um, I don't see that changing. Uh, the wealthiest zip codes are all Democrat. The ascendant industries are all uh, Democratic. The GOP donor coalition is basically a few finance guys who can't get along with every with anybody else. Um, the natural resources industry, um, small businesses with a lot of labor, you know, um, really dependent on keeping labor costs low, stuff like that. It's basically the losers of the last 30 years. Um, and the Democrats represent the ascendant economic winners. Um, I don't think another lecture on Hayek is gonna change that for anybody. And, and I think that the, you know, all the talk about the values of capitalism and all of that at this point uh, in the type of economy we have very dependent on consumerism, very dependent on, um, Fed support for financial asset prices, uh, very dependent actually on limiting uh, ties to and restrictions on worker mobility, uh, very, very insistent on being able to do free trade with anybody and not restricting anything. Um, for all those reasons, the kind of conventional neocon bourgeois virtue type stuff doesn't really, isn't needed or wanted by the ascended sectors of capital and the economy. Um, as such, if the GOP wants to compete, uh, assuming it wants to look something like the, have something like the agenda it has now and something like the voter base it has now, uh, then it's going to have to offer something to its working class constituencies rather than just uh, go and, and uh, you know, try to remove the uh, uh, carried interest loophole uh, while private equity gives more money to Democrats. Great. Um, I guess we'll probably have time for one more. Uh, audience member asks, perhaps the closest idea we have today to being a new great society is the proposal of racial reparations. Do reparations necessarily have to be redistributional? Uh, for example, what if large swaths of federal land were given to black people instead of existing private property being taken and redistributed? Um, I mean, I could just quickly say that I, I don't think that reparations uh, should be should be high on the list um, of, of priorities for President elect Biden. Uh, I certainly think advancing economic opportunity should be I think there should be a focus on the working class and on lower income Americans. Um, and uh, to the extent that the legacy of slavery has uh, served as an obstacle for people who are who are trying to advance in the economy uh, today, which I think the evidence suggests that it, that it certainly has. Uh, those programs should be available. They should be improved. They should be expanded where necessary. Um, uh, but in terms of uh, reparations, as the term is commonly understood, I think that uh, should not be um, on, on, on the top of the priority list. One of the, uh, the question is a little loaded, if I understand it right. The question is how should the reparations function and would large swaths of federal land be giving to people instead of money be better? Um, I very much, I think the, let's just put it this way. The evidence suggests people do better with property that is not welfare that they earn themselves. The very interesting case in the 1960s was Goldberg v. Kelly, which made entitlements, that is welfare payments, property or suggested that that interpretation was, was acceptable. That wasn't great for anybody, particularly not African Americans. Um, it it um, absolutely deprived many families of an opportunity to take enterprise seriously. So um, my question is not how do you give reparations, but whether reparations, even if they're called 
pro have a property aspect are, are a good idea. What we owe all Americans is an opportunity to make their own money. That's what we owe them. Uh, and that, that should be the emphasis optimally. Um, I would, yeah, I would um, largely agree. Uh, I think this gets back to one thing I was discussing earlier, which is I think the Great Society took us to a, what you might call a secondary redistribution model, where you sort of leave the productive parts of the economy alone, you just redistribute to whichever groups you want, as opposed to what might be called the primary redistribution model, where you actually try to make the economy work uh, better and, and improve uh, technology, improve productivity, improve infrastructure, improve all those things. Now, it might very well be reasonable to want to um, help even more certain disadvantaged groups, though I would I would hope that you know we would do that by actually helping the economically disadvantaged, not by uh, racial categories. Um, but obviously, uh, the discourse may be moving in another direction on that. Um, but I think you know that's a, that sort of secondary redistribution is in contrast to the more successful American model of earlier in history, as well as to what's been a very successful Asian development model uh, in in recent years, which is focused more on productive capacity and less on redistribution. Great. Um, I try to get in one more question here, and I'm going to paraphrase it because it's a bit long, but uh, as audience member asks, so we've been practicing Chicago school neoliberal economics since at least 1976. Um, so what, what's kind of the rationale or, or what's, what's, what's the rationale for continuing on along this path um, or the rationale for getting off of the path um, kind of set up, set, set on by um, Milton Friedman and uh, Republican presidents in the era since the 1960s? Quick answer. We haven't. Sure. Been, yeah. Uh, quick we answer. We haven't really been doing pure classical liberalism, so the question is too loaded. We've had way too much uh, government intervention at many points. Um, there's, a, I sense, an effort in the virtual room to be new and cool. Actually, a lot of old ideas are pretty good. Um, if you go, nothing is new. It is just forgotten. We repeat the same mistakes. Um, so have a look, but but I think it would be wrong to uh, portray America as being neoliberal under Jimmy Carter, um, which is the suggestion. Have a, a go back and have a look at the period, and particularly the, for example, the taxes on business, particularly the capital gains tax, um, which uh, kept products uh, unavailable to consumers a good fifteen years uh, more than they had to be. They were already invented. Um, so, you know, I, 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 I'm not sure the framing of the question is, is quite how I would frame it. I mean, I would say there's really no reason to um, pay attention to Chicago School Economics at all at this point. I'd say it's thoroughly discredited. Um, you can see that in part by the fact that, you know, there's been a complete disconnect between savings and investment. Increasing savings has nothing to do with increasing investment, um, as well as the fact that, you know, a lot of it is built on the idea that sort of capital is the most scarce resource and the most important thing to do is maximize returns to capital. When in fact today, if anything, we see that capital is probably the least scarce resource of all. Uh, and the fact that it has the sort of Reagan model um, of low taxes and so on is broken down, not really producing productive investment, but producing a lot of asset price inflation. Uh, I think we need a new way to think about this, a new way to think about how to revive the U.S. economy, and also a new way to deal. Uh, you know, Chicago School never really paid much attention to what you do when you have massive other economies injecting huge subsidies in, into the economy. Um, what that does, you know, is that is that um, exchange worth it when you're basically giving up your long-term productive capacity for some short-term financial benefits? Um, I think the answer at this point is obviously no, and I think we need a new model to think about all these issues. Um, you know, I think that we have actually seen over the past several years a turn away from neoliberal economics, uh, and we see the results, and they're not good. Uh, neoliberal economics says you shouldn't have price controls. Um, if you look at the evidence on what happens when you raise the minimum wage to $15 an hour. What do you see, uh, at least so far, is that not only does employment fall, but people's earnings fall because the drop in 
uh, hours of work is larger than the increase in the wage that workers receive. And so their actual earnings drop, and that's just their hours. Uh, neoliberal economics says that we should embrace free trade and we should not have trade barriers. Well, President Trump increased trade barriers during his time in office. And what happened? Consumer prices increased, the variety of goods available for sale in the United States decreased, the cost of intermediate goods to production increased. And not only did the overall economy suffer, but the manufacturing sector suffered. The idea that everybody would pay a little bit more for a can of chicken soup, but we'd have this manufacturing renaissance never materialized. More than that, the best research that currently exists uh, on the subject has actually found that the president's trade war reduced employment in the manufacturing sector because trade wars do not work. So I understand people's frustration with the slow recovery from the Great Recession. I understand why that inflamed populist sentiment on both the political right and the political left. I can even understand the appeal of a Trumpian populist nationalist figure, at least intellectually, um, at some times. But I think that the argument that we should have a wholesale retreat or even a partial retreat from uh, you know, basic principles of economic policy that governed the Clinton administration and that governed uh, the Reagan and Bush administration. I, I, I think people who are advocating for that need to, need to provide some evidence that that would actually lead to better outcomes for workers and better outcomes for households. The evidence I know of uh, all points in the opposite direction. All right, well, uh, terrific. Thank you so much for participating in this panel. Um, we're very thrilled to have you all for this wide ranging discussion. Um, and to our audience, we'll look forward to seeing you tomorrow at 4.30 for our panel on uh, counterculture um, since the 1960s. So thank you all again and uh, have a good evening. Take care, bye-bye.